New year, new me, right? Most people have things in their past that they'd love to change. Words they said that they wish they could unsay. Things they've done that they wish they could undo. While we can't change our past, we can make the decision to change our future. And for many of us, it's time to do just that. Want to write a book? Then you'll need to invest your time in writing. Want to run a marathon? Then you'll need to make time to train. Want to win a championship? You're going to have to practice and continue to get better. Want to graduate from college? Then you'll need to put in the hour studying. Want to be a leader? You're going to have to persevere when you feel like quitting. Want to be a better grandparent, spouse, or friend? You're going to have to invest in quality time with them. Want to be more present with your child at home? You're going to have to say no to some opportunities. Want to reconcile a relationship? You have to be willing to forgive. Time is an incredible gift from God. It's what we do with our time today that determines the outcomes of our lives tomorrow. Join us over the next few weeks and get intentional with what we do with our time, starting today. There is a time for everything, but not time for everything. It's time. It's great to be with you. Some of you all, you'll know me because I've been here before. Others of you, this is the first time you've had a chance to hear from me. For those of you who have never heard from me before, my name's Dale Schaefer, and I serve as a pastor to pastors across central and northern Florida for about 130 pastors. And for the last, oh, two and a half years, I have been one of your pastor's pastors. And it's an incredible joy to get to open the scriptures with you this morning. I've been getting to know your staff a little bit over the last couple of months as well. And so it's been a joy to get to know Pastor Brett, but it's also been an incredible joy on Tuesday mornings to get to spend some time with your pastoral staff. And then I'm also working with your search committee as well as your church board on your pastoral search process. So uh, Dale Schaefer, if you got nasty grams you want to send about the process, send them to me, Dale, at FloridaNaz.com. I'm your guy, all right? It's so good, though, seriously, to be with you this morning um, and to open up the scriptures. And I really do believe it's time. It's time that God wants to speak to us as individuals, but to us as a church. You know, waiting time is not wasted time in the life of a church. While we're seeking God for what he has for us for a lead pastor, I just believe that God wants to do a work in his church during that time. Don't you believe that? And so if you got your Bibles with you, I want you to open them up, an Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage for us today. And they're going to speak kind of about the same thing. Isn't it interesting how God's word is consistent throughout his word? The same kind of words that he spoke in the past, he spoke just hundreds of years later to the church. And then I believe that the Spirit wants to speak to us today. And so if you got your Bibles, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. And then in the New Testament, we're going to jump over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, like verses 15, 16, and 17. A little bit more in the New Testament. Ephesians 5, 15, 16, and 17. I'll get over there in just a little bit. And what I want to talk to you about this morning is time. I want to talk to you about what you do with your time. In fact, over, over the next four weeks... Different pastors from the church are going to be talking to us about what we do with our time, specifically around four words, those four words, and I want us to kind of get them locked in in our heads. The first word is start. We're going to talk about what does God want us to maybe start in this year? Is there something that we have been needing to do that we've been putting off? We're like, you know, one day I will get to that, and now the Holy Spirit is going to say through a season of prayer, it's, it's time. It's time for you to start that. It's time for you to uh, start a uh, new relationship. You've been in this waiting season and you've been wondering, man, but now it's time to start that. Maybe it's time to start a, a new career path or it's time to begin to go to school. You've been putting it off. You've been thinking about it. And it's like, no, now is the year to do that. This is the year to begin to exercise. Whatever it might be, there's something that God wants you to start this year. This is the year to start getting into the scriptures and begin picking up one of those life journals. And you heard about it last year and you said, I should do that. But other things got into your calendar and you never made time for it. This is the year to start getting into God's word, listening to God. The, the second word that I want you to think about is this word, stop. Stop. 
Is this a year that God might have for you to stop something? There's something you've been giving your time to. There's something you've been giving your attention to. And this is the year that God is saying, no, stop. There's something else that needs your time right now. There's something else that needs your focus right now. Anyone in here got any stinking thinking going on in your head? Do you know what I'm talking about? Those, those thoughts, not just about others, but maybe about yourself. And the Spirit is saying to you, it's time to stop being your own worst enemy in this season. It's time to stop something. Uh, others of you, the, the word is continue. You started really well, and life got difficult, and you were making great progress. And then about September, about October, as we got into the holidays especially, all of those practices that were paying off so many dividends in your life, that kind of went by the wayside. And what the Spirit is saying to you in this season is, it's time to pick it back up. Let's continue that thing that you started so well in. Don't let yourself get distracted by good things and miss out on the best things that God has for you. It's time to continue in the year ahead. Last word. I think it might be the most important one. We'll talk about it the last week of the series. It's connect. It's connect. Is it time to connect with someone? I had the opportunity the other day to go to a bowl game with a buddy of mine from college over in Orlando. We went over to the Citrus Bowl. He's a big Iowa Hawkeyes fan. Happened to be in town with his family for the holidays celebrating. We hadn't seen each other for like six years. Anyone got any friends like that? They were like really good friends and you haven't seen them for a really, really long time. And we reconnected and it was like the Spirit said to me, not just particularly about this friend, but just in general, the Spirit was like, Dale, in the last couple of years, you haven't been nearly as connected to a group of peers that are seeking after me in the way that you were in the prior season, and it's time to reconnect. Could it be time for you to connect? I'm convinced there's places that God wants to take you in your faith that you cannot get on your own. Several years ago, I did a 50K ultra marathon, like 6,000 feet of elevation game. It was brutal. It was like 84 degrees out. And all the elevation gain is like in the final three miles of the race. If I had been running the race on my own, I would have quit. But I had two friends who I had trained with for three months. I had two friends that were running the race with me. And as I'm climbing the last bit of elevation game and I wanted to quit, my body was like trying to break down. My buddy Phil said, no, man, you can do this thing. If it hadn't been for Phil, I wouldn't have finished the race. And there are places that God wants to take you in your faith this year that unless you've got someone like that in your journey, you'll give up. And the Spirit is going to say, it's time to connect. Those four words, start, stop, continue, or connect. What are you going to do with your time this year? Question, how do you know what to do with your time? Just a quick question, like how do you know what to do with your time? How do you keep time? Uh, anyone, uh, you got a watch? Apple watch. Any Apple watch wearers in the room? Yeah, yeah. Okay, got some Apple watch wearers in the room. Any Garmin wearers? I, I'm like, I run, so I got a Garmin's what I wear. Uh, how many of you use your phone to keep track of time? Phone folk, okay. And then, and then I've noticed that as you get older, you don't really need a watch and you don't really need a phone to keep track of time. It's like your body keeps track of time for you. Do you know what I mean? And there just comes a point where your body tells you when to get out of bed in the morning. Your body tells you when it's time to eat. Now that's talking about like, that's talking about like chronos time. That's a Greek word. It means just like the 24 hours in a day, chronos, chronological time. But the Bible talks about a second kind of time, and it's kairos time. In the New Testament, it's the word kairos, and it means like divine time. It means just the right time. The prophet says that at just the right time, when time was fulfilled, God sent his one son. That's kairos time. That's a divine time. When the time had come, Jesus would talk about this. He'd say, my hour has not yet come. The time isn't right. Everyone wanted him to be brought up as the king. And he just says, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not yet time. It's not yet kairos for me. But there did come that kairos moment for him. See, I'm not so much concerned about the chronos stuff as I am the kairos stuff. What time is it for you right now? What do you need to give your attention to in this year ahead? The author of Ecclesiastes writes it this way in Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1. He says, there is a time for everything. I think he's talking about like chronos time. 
I think he's talking about like there's a right time to eat lunch, there's a right time, you know, for this and for that. But then he says there is a season for every activity under heaven. Now we're talking kairos. We're talking God's season for you. You know your life has seasons, right? I've got three daughters. Two of them have flown the coop, guys. Like one of them is even married now and is expecting like a grandbaby. Well, she's not expecting our grandbaby, her first child. It's about to be grandparent time. Come on. I'm so excited. I love my girls, but I'm kind of excited to have a granddaughter. That's going to be a season. You know, those daughters of mine, I've only had so long with them. They're four years old, and then they're 14 years old, and then they're 40 years old. You know what I mean? And there's a season where you have influence with them. And I know some of you, some of you here, you're like, can we just like, can we just advance a little bit? Like, I'm tired of changing diapers. Can we just, don't be so quick. God wants to do something in that season that you're in right now. That's the, the kairos time. So how do you know what season, what time it is for you, what you should give your, your energies to in this time? Because the truth is, we, we heard it in the video roll in, there is a time for everything. There's a right time for you to do everything, but there is not time for everything. Amen? There is a right time for every activity in your life, but you can't possibly do everything all at once. How many of y'all have ever tried to do everything all at once? Come on, get, be honest. This is church. Y'all got to raise your hands now. You've done this. It doesn't work well. We need God's help in discerning what time it is for us right now. So what we're challenging you to and what we're challenging the church to over this next month is 21 days of prayer and fasting. Now, I'm not saying give up everything in your life. Like, don't just eat anything. That's really bad advice right now. If you do fast food, like, talk to a medical professional about whether that's wise for you. But what might God have you set aside so that you can more fully give your attention to hearing from God in the next 21 days. Because I think he wants to speak to you. And I think he wants to speak to us. I want to encourage you, be in worship every weekend. Whether it's online or in person, like don't miss a weekend. Because we're listening to God's spirit together. Let's carve out, let's just at least fast our Sunday mornings. So that we can carve out time to hear from God together over this next month. Because I think he wants to speak about things to start, to stop, to continue, and how he might have us to connect. Because there is a time for everything, but there is not time for everything. The question is, what time is it? What I'm praying is this, is that if we will listen closely enough to the Spirit, God might help us to redeem our time. That's a biblical word, that that idea of redeeming time. In Ephesians, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16, Paul speaks a word And it's a word that has reverberated throughout the church, throughout history. It's the same word that Solomon was talking about in in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. This word that what we do with our time matters and doing it at the right time matters. And that word reverberated through the Old Testament, through the life of Jesus who came at just the right time, who walked so closely with the Spirit that he was willing to lay his life down when God called him to lay his life down. That word reverberated so fully in Jesus' life that he lived fully surrendered to God. And it reverberated so fully into the future that when the Apostle Paul heard this word of leaving his past and being made new and being renewed and given new birth, it reverberated in his spirit that he lived his life on purpose. And he thought it was so important that you and I do it, that he wrote it down in a letter that was shared around the early church. And it has reverberated throughout the centuries of the church up until now. And as I read it, would it reverberate in your spirit today, this word of truth that God wants to redeem your time Paul would write in Ephesians 5, verse 16, redeem the time because the days are evil. And that was true in Paul's day, and it's true in our day. This idea of redeeming time, guys, it's so big. It's such a powerful concept. To redeem something means to buy it back or to buy it up or to rescue it from some other purpose. It means to be set free. And man, I know that some of us here, our time needs to be set free. You have a spiritual enemy who seeks to steal, kill, and destroy your faith, your family, and your future. He wants your time. What you do with your time determines the outcomes you experience in life. And God says... 
through Paul, redeem the time, buy it up, set it free. Y'all just set some people free in the last month. You know this, right? This church did a Christmas offering. Uh, The goal was to raise $75,000. A third of that was set aside to redeem medical debt, to buy up medical debt from people in Polk County that did not have the means to pay for that medical debt, who were living in the chains of medical debt and oppression, feeling like there was no hope, no way for them to pay that debt off. And this church took a special offering to redeem people, to set them free so that money that others would seem to be used for another purpose might be released for a better purpose. And y'all didn't just raise $75,000, by the way. You raised $85,000. So give God some glory in this place this morning. That's what it means to redeem something. You're doing that in this community. God wants to do that with your life. He wants to do that with your time. And here's what I'm praying. Here's what I'm hoping. Here's what I'm believing. If you will seek him first if you will listen to what he would have you to do with your time, you might a week from now look back and go, I lived a redemptive day last week. You tracking with me? Like that was a redemptive day. And could you imagine if maybe a month from now as we were together worshiping, you came up to me and you were to say, not only did I live a redemptive day, I think I lived at least a redemptive week, maybe even two redemptive weeks in this last month. And could you imagine a church that together was trying to live redemptive days, weeks, months, that maybe a year from now we might be able to look back and said, as a church, we lived a redemptive life in that community. Can you imagine the kind of impact that God could have through a church that was filled with people who were living redemptive lives? Man, I long to see that kind of thing happen. Why can't it happen here? Why can't it happen here? Could we live redemptive lives? So what does that look like? Well, here's here's what I want to do with the rest of my time. I want to share with you three truths about time. And then I want to share with you kind of three applications of how we can live redemptively with our time, what we can do to redeem our time. So three truths and three kind of applications of how we redeem our time. Just real quick, if you're taking notes, write this down. Three truths about time. First of all, your time is limited. Your time is limited. Today you have 24 hours. Tomorrow you will not get 25. And and, and let's be honest, there's no guarantee of tomorrow, is there? Your time is limited. It would be nice to say that we all have 365 days this year, but the truth is there are some of us hearing this message today that will not have 365 days this year. I, I don't say that to be negative or to bring a spirit of depression upon this place. I simply say it because it's true. You aren't guaranteed this year. You know, I think the old timers kind of got this, right? I don't know if anyone had been around the church a while. We used to have this thing. I I never really said it much. I kind of laughed at it. My parents would say it once in a while. They would say, hey, I'll meet you for lunch on Thursday. And then we put this little phrase at the end. Anyone know what it is? (laughs) Yeah, you got it. Lord willing. If God sees fit to give me till Thursday... I'll I'll see you Thursday, but I'm not certain that I've got Thursday guaranteed. It might not be a bad thing for us to bring back Lord willing. If God sees fit, this year I'm going to make these plans, but I don't know for certain that I have it. And that kind of perspective that my time is limited, it helps me to really value time rightly rather than the way the world values time, which is like we're going to have it forever. Your time is limited In Job, we read this in Job 14, verse 5, it just says this. It says, man's days are determined. That's that's not determinism, that God sits around and goes, well, you're going to do this and this and this and this, and so you have no free will. No, we believe that God gives us free will. Man's days are determined. You have decreed the number. This is what he's saying. You've decreed the number of months, and here it is. You've set limits you can't exceed. You've tried to get more done than anyone could possibly get done in 24 hours before, amen? Amen. There are limits on your time. And I will tell you, if you push your limits, you will find out that you have limits, right? Your body, it has limits. The psalmist writes, you make me lie down in green pastures. If you don't take time to lie down, God will make you lie down. 
Your body will eventually make you lie down. You have limits on your time. We have to learn to live within the limits that God has, has given us with our time. The, the, the second thing that you need to know about your time, first, it's all limited. Secondly, it all gets spent. It all gets invested somewhere. You can't save your time, right? You can save money, but you can't save time. I've got three daughters. I want to help all three of them with their college education. And so from a pretty early age, we've been setting money aside to be able to give a certain number to each of them every single year so that the full weight of their college education isn't upon them. I grew up in a family that was largely a, a poverty family, and so we didn't have a lot of means to assist with education. So I took on massive debt in order to pursue a college education. I just didn't want that for my daughters, and so I wanted to set aside money. I wanted to save the money to relieve them in the future. You can save money, but you can't save time, right? You can't bottle it up and go, you know, I don't much care for that four-year-old time with my kid, so I'm going to bottle and save some of those preschool years and save them for the teenage years because I like those years better. I want a few more years to use in the, the teenage years. You can't, you can't do that. You can't save time. It all gets spent. And the third thing is this, is that someone's going to tell you what to do with your time. Someone's going to determine how you spend your time. Now, I hope, I hope that you're a part of that say, but in some places, people don't have a lot of say about what they do with their time. Anyone in here, you got a boss? Uh, any bosses in here? Any bo I'm a boss. Anyone, like, uh, someone, someone's going to quote me on that. He says he's a boss. <laughs> any bosses in the room? If you have the responsibility for giving direction to how your team's time gets invested, you need to give prayerful consideration to the kind of expectations, the kind of culture you're creating within your organization. When I served as a lead pastor of a local church, one of the things that I realized is we had, we had a Saturday night service and we had Sunday morning service. We had Saturday night and then two Sunday morning services, three services every weekend. And our staff were expected to work until noon on Friday. So oh, hang on, let me get this straight. We're giving them from noon Friday to noon on Saturday off. They get 24 hours, that's it? That's a dysfunctional structure. And so we had to make adjustments. We gave everyone Friday off, shut the whole office down on Fridays, had a care plan for the church, but gave our staff the time to rest and renew. You have a responsibility as a leader to create a structure in which people can really thrive and they can really grow and blossom into what God has for them if you're a leader. You need to think through who's calling the shots and what you do with your time. And you might be here, well, I don't have a lot of control over my time. I love Daniel's story. Folks, I love Daniel's story. In the Old Testament, we read about Daniel and his boss, the, the king. He, he says, listen, Daniel, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to so micromanage your life. Some of you don't have bosses like this. He so micromanaged Daniel's life, he told Daniel what he could eat, the kind of food he could eat. He says, here's what you can eat. I want you to eat what everyone else that's on my staff eats. And Daniel couldn't do that because he would compromise his, his relationship with God. It would violate the commands of the Old Testament laws. And so Daniel says, I can't do that. But Daniel doesn't just push back. He brings a plan to his boss about what he could do to reorder his time, what he would put in his body. He goes to his boss and he says, listen, let's run a test. You let your whole team eat what you tell them to eat, and I'm going to eat what my God tells me to eat. I'm going to order my life the way my God tells me to order my life and then see if I'm not just as productive, if not more productive, than the rest of the team. And we'll evaluate it in 30 days. If you got a supervisor like that, that's demanding that you get 70 hours of productivity out of 75 hours of work, maybe consider bringing a plan to them. Hey, I think in 45 hours I can get done what everyone else is getting done in 70 if I order my time rightly. Can I at least have a month to test it out and see how it works? Someone is going to tell you what to do with your time. Don't let the world and don't let the culture tell you what to do with your time. Don't let the world and culture tell you what to do with your children's time. Listen, the world and culture doesn't care about the practice of Sabbath. It doesn't care about rest. We are open 24-7 because we are a culture of consumerism. We're a culture of capitalism. And that engine, it just drives and drives and drives. It doesn't know how to rest. It's a culture of Pharaoh. God's culture is not like that. And so as a follower of Christ, you've got to learn to rest and to Sabbath and not let the culture determine what you do with your calendar. Someone is going to tell you what to do with your time. 
I would ask this, what would it look like if you took the time you've been given and you brought it back to the one who gave it to you to begin with and you said, what would you have me to do with my time? That's what Daniel did. What would happen if we did that? That's what we're saying over this next month. So how do we redeem our time? What do we do with it? Well, three things that I think can help us here. If you're taking notes, kind of track along with me. One, and we hit on this limiting thing earlier, but this is a new way of looking at it. First, recognize your days are numbered. Recognize your days are numbered. You only have so many days. You only have so many weeks. You only have so many months. And none of us know exactly how long that is. I mean, if we live healthy lives, generally speaking, we get 70 to 80 years. That's what Moses says in Psalm 90, Psalm 90, it's the oldest psalm in all of the scriptures. Psalm 90, verse 12, Moses writes this. He just says, God, teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. I'm going to ask you, what's your posture towards God? Is your posture God? You kind of like puff your chest up and say, God, you owe me. God, this is what I need. That's not a, a teachable spirit. That's not a humble posture. That's not the posture of a student. No, the posture that Moses is talking about is that we come to God. We come humble as a student. We say, God, you've given me this time. I want to steward it well. What would you have me to do with it? That's the posture. That's a posture that God can bless. Teach us to number our days aright that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Earlier in this passage, Moses would say, it's given to man 70 years, and if by measure of strength, 80 years. Kind of curious. Anyone over 70 in the room? Help me out. Over 70 in the balcony? Anyone on the floor? I mean, come on, let's just do this. Okay, here we go. All right. There's a few of you. More in the first service. More in the first service. Here's what I want to know. Anyone over 80 years old in the room today? Help me out. Put it up nice and high. You should be really proud. Anyone over 80? Anyone over, if you're over 80, that's bonus time right there. Give it up for anyone that's on bonus time. Come on. (laughs) That's awesome. That's not guaranteed, though. It's not guaranteed. I remember a few years ago, my daughter, my oldest daughter, Helena, she's 25, just turned about to turn 26. And uh, I don't know, she just turned 26. She's going to be 27 this year. It's crazy. Time flies, doesn't it? Eight years ago, she came to us. She was a freshman in college. She was on college break over the winter, and she sat down at our kitchen table with us, and our other two daughters were at the table. And she says, I realized something the other day. I realized that she was engaged to her um, fiancé at the time. They're planning on getting married right after college. She says, I realized I've got three more years as a single person to be able to invest in my sisters. And that once I get married, my, my flexibility, my availability is going to change. And she said, I want to order the last three years that I have as a single person around the reality of how can I best invest in my sisters over this next three years. She she just had this wisdom around what season she was in. I I want that kind of wisdom. And if God can, don't you think if God can give that wisdom to a 19-year-old, he can give it to us? I think he can do that. I, I love this story of the guy, he turns 50. True story, turns 50 years old. And he heard this passage of scripture and he went out and he realized if I, if I have a strong life, I'll live to 80. That means I've got like 1,300 weeks left to live. And so he goes out and he buys 1,300 marbles and he puts them in a glass jar, big glass jar, puts it on his kitchen counter. And every Saturday he goes out to the glass jar at the counter and he pulls two marbles out. He holds one in his right hand and one in his left hand. The one in his right hand, he prays over, and he prays, God, thank you for this last week. And he reflects back over the way that he spent his time in the last week. He gives thanks to God for the gift of the past week. And then he takes the marble in his left hand, and it represents the week ahead of him, Lord willing. And he prays over that marble, God, give me a heart of wisdom about what you'd have me to do with this next week. And then he places the left marble back in the jar, And he takes the right marble and he walks it to the trash can and he throws it away because it's invested. He can't get it back. He was literally losing his marbles one week at a time is what was, I'm sorry, it was so bad, so bad. That was actually a shout out to Pastor Brett for all of his dad jokes. I I told him, I said, I'm going to work a dad joke in this weekend. And so you need to know that. But I, I love that story, this idea that you can live with this kind of discernment and gratitude and thanksgiving to God and that God will help us to order our days rightly because they're numbered. And that's the second thing. So first, remember that your days are numbered. You only get so many of them. 
They're not guaranteed. Secondly, prioritize accordingly. You, you need to look at your time and then put priorities around what you're going to do with your time. Several years ago, I was going through a season of, of anxiety. I was dealing with panic attacks. I was disordered in the way that I was ordering my time. Anyone else, you would admit you've been in that space. Maybe not panic attacks, but you, you were disordered in the way that you ordered your time. That's where I was at. I was trying to be a husband. I was trying to be a parent. I was trying to be a church planter. I was actually a youth pastor and a church planter at the same time. It was out of control, unmanageable, 80, 90 hour weeks. I was like 100 pounds overweight. There was just all kinds of things that were a struggle for me. And I had a friend who gave me a piece of wisdom. He gave me a book. He said, hey, let me share this with you. And some of you are familiar with this book. It's Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Anyone, you've heard of that book before? Um, Covey has a practice in there that really was wisdom for me. He says, what you do is you set aside a day and you reflect on your funeral, the day that you die, and they come together to celebrate you, and everyone says all the nice things. And sit down and think about the key relationships in your life. If you're married, your spouse, your kids, uh, the congregation you lead, your friends, God, and write a paragraph or two about what you would like them to say at the end of your life, at your funeral. If they were saying you had lived your life to its fullest. If you'd lived a redemptive life, what would it look like? And you write out exactly in detail what they would say. And then he said, I want you to take another session and I want you to just do an as-is reality of your life. If you died today and they were 100% honest and they didn't do all the flowery talk they do at memorials and they just told the truth about you, what kind of a husband are you? What kind of a parent are you? What kind of a follower of Christ are you? What kind of a friend are you? In my case, what kind of a pastor are you? And I want you to just write, if they told the truth, what would they say? And then lament the gap between the person you are and the person that you long to be in Christ. And then submit to God's help in, in ordering your time in such a way that you might live into that future that he's called you to live into. For me, that meant putting together like a little 10-page life plan that had some real actionable items about what I would do. And it was overwhelming. I remember looking at it and thinking, I mean, I got like 12 areas of my life that need fixed here, and I've got 365 days this year. There's no way I can fix it all. And my friend said, well, you can't fix everything, but you can fix something. You can go to work on these areas with God's help, and you need to discern, pray, God, what would you have me to go after this year? And next year, Lord willing, and the next year, Lord willing. And over time, God began to transform my life. You know, in the church world, we call this a big fancy word. It's sanctification. It means we're just surrendering every area of our life, my relationships, my physical body and being, my mindset, my vocation and calling. It's just like everything gets surrendered over to God and we say, God, it's all yours. What would you have me to do with it? That's what we're talking about. And God works transformation when we prioritize according to his word and his will. So what's one new practice you might bring in this year? Pray about that over the next 21 days. I had a friend um, that prayed this prayer about two years ago, and he has three son, young sons at home. And what he felt compelled to do was that every Friday, he knew he only had a short window with his kids, every Friday he was going to write them a personal note card of encouragement of what he saw in their life and what he hoped for their life. And he would put it in a little mailbox, in their mailbox at the house. And every Friday, his kids would get a piece of mail from him. Personal message. It began to work transformation in his family and in his children's life. That was an example of what this might look like. So how, you, how do you redeem your time? One, recognize your days are numbered. Two, prioritize accordingly. Three, and I think this is most important, invest time with God first. Invest time with, like, take the time that you have. Bring it back to the one who gave it to you be, to begin with and say, what do you want me to do with this? That's why we're calling the church to a season of prayer and fasting over these next 21 days. God, you've given us this time. What do you want us to do with this time? How do we bring glory to you with this time in this year ahead, in my family, in my own personal formation? How would you have me to bring glory to you? Here's what I'd like for you to do. Would you just close your eyes for a moment I didn't do this first service. I think there's someone here that God wants to lift a burden. Our sister talked about it earlier. You're heavy in your spirit today. You're burdened down. You're worried about a lot. 
would you just bring to mind whatever has you worried or anxious right now? Just bring it to mind. You probably don't have to work very hard. And would you remember the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount? When he says, look at the flowers of the field. Look at the birds of the air. They don't labor. They don't spin. They don't work hard. Yet your heavenly Father takes care of them. Are you not much more important than they are? Jesus says in Matthew 11, his yoke is easy and his burden is light. Would you let him lift your burden today? Would you let him give you joy? His burden's light. He cares. And then he says, so seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all this other stuff you're worried about. It's going to be added to you as well. And so, Father, we, we come to you right now and we want your kingdom we want your righteousness. And there's so much that we are worried about, that we are concerned about. And at times, Lord, it's heavy. If we're honest, we want to try to control the outcomes. Oh, God, help us to trust. Help us to seek you first. And that as we seek you first, you have promised, and you are a promise maker and a promise keeper. You have promised that all of these things will be added to us as well. So help us to seek you first. Help us to make room. What would you have us to start? We need wisdom. Teach us. We might have ideas. We submit them to your authority. What would you have us to stop? We want to hear from you. We have to hear from you. What would you have us to continue? Oh, we want to become like Jesus. And you've been doing a good work. You've been transforming us from the inside out. Oh, we want that to continue. Who would you have us to connect with? There's places you want to take us. We'll never get there on our own, God. Give us discernment, a heart of wisdom to know who that person might be for us. Most of all, we know it's you. So help us to seek you first, to connect with you first, to prioritize our time with you. I pray this all in the wonderful name of Jesus, who lived a life fully submitted to the Father, who modeled for us what this sanctified, fully surrendered life looks like who gave us the picture of what our life, when it's fully formed in the way that you'd have for it to be, would look. We pray it in his wonderful name. Amen.